Welcome everyone and welcome back to another BGCSE Biology Past Paper Review. Today we are reviewing a paper one from the year 2021. Before we start the examination, please remember to write your school number, your candidate number, your surname and your initials. Before we start the examination, please remember to read through the entire instructions given and if you have any question or any queries, please ask the examiner before you begin the examination. All right, let's jump into our first question. And our first question is, the classification of one species of grasshopper is as follows. They gave you the kingdom, the phylum, the class, the order, the family, the genus, and the species. The kingdom is Anomalia because it is an animal. The phylum is arthropoda because it is an arthropod. The class is insecta because it is an insect. The order is arthropteria. The family is archididae. And the genus is schistocerca. And the species is americana. Now the question now reads, what is the binomial name for this species of grasshopper? First and foremost, the binomial name is also called the scientific name. And the scientific name includes the genus and the species. So if you should go back to the list, you should include the genus first, this written first, then the species. So therefore, your answer should be our Schistocera circa Americana. So D will be our answer, okay? So Sisto Circa Americana is the scientific name for this specific grasshopper. All right, let's go to question number two. And question number two, the diagram shows a food web. And in this food web, it asks now that which is an example of an organism that occupies the third trophic level. Now, quick point to note is that trophic level is all the level of the food chain or food web. In this case, a food web. So the producer is always the first. So let's go through this food web quickly and determine our third trophic level organism. And so if you start from the land plants, you go to the aphids and the beetles. So beetles will be a third trophic level organism. If you go the opposite way, which is the land plants, then the grasshopper, lizard is a third, and also frogs will also be a third trophic level organism. So we have three third trophic level organisms in this food web. So let's go to our answer and see which of them is actually correct. So, for here, now we go back. Again, let's just quickly go back. We have frogs, lizards, and beetles. So, the only one given here is actually um, beetles. All right. So, that will be our option right there. All right. Let's go to our next question, which is question number three. And question number three, is said, how do omnivores obtain the complex molecules they need to live and grow? Now, first thing, remember that omnivores, they feed on both plants and animals. So they will get their food from the plants and animals. So let's go through the list. And A saying by feeding on consumers only. And that is not true because um, if they feed on consumers only, that means it's only animals or, okay, or only meat. B saying by feeding on consumers and producers. Yes, that one seems good because they feed on consumers, which are animals, and producers, uh, which are plants. So that one looks good so far. Let's check C. It said by manufacturing them all from simple molecules, which is not true, by feeding on producers only, which is not true. Herbivores will do that, feed on producers only. So definitely uh, B is our correct answer. Now let's jump into question number four. And question number four, it reads, which of the following is a biotic factor in the environment? And biotic means living factor. So it's living. 
All right, so rainfall is non-living, so that could not be your answer. Plant life is a living, so definitely number four is B. All right, temperature and soil type, those are non-living components of the environment. All right, let's go to question number five. And question number five reads, which type of mangrove is found growing mainly in the low tide zone? And when you say the low tide zone, if a tide is low, which of the mangrove will still be in the water? And so for question number five, it is the red mangroves. Because remember, red mangroves, they will always be in the water, whether the tide is high or low. However, the black and white mangroves, those are only experiencing water around their soil only when the tide is high. Okay, because remember, the black mangrove and the white mangroves, those mangroves are mostly landward. Okay, so the first in the water is the red mangrove, then the black, then the white, then the buttonhood in that specific order. All right, so let's go to question number six real quick. And question number six, it reads that the table shows the energy input into each trophic level within a particular ecosystem in one air. So notice here now we have the producers, and the producers are producing um, 10,000 joules of energy. Then they go to, go to 1,000, then they go to 100 joules, then they go to 10 joules. And this is indicating that the energy is decreasing by 10% um, as you go up the food chain. So the question now reads, now, which statement correctly describe an energy transfer shown in the pyramid of energy? And so here is a 10% of energy is transferred up from the producer to the primary consumer. And so this is a producer, this is a primary consumer. And of course, 1,000 is 10% of 10,000. All right. And so A, looking good so far. And so we can actually decide on A. Um, but before we do that, let's quickly look at B. So 10% of energy is transferred up from the producer to the secondary consumer, which is not true. Because if you go back to this, if you move from 10,000 all the way to 100, that is not 10%. Okay? All right. So C is said that 10% of energy is transferred up from the producer to the tertiary, which is not true as well. It is by E trophic level. So definitely we'll go back to our answer as A. All right. So A is our answer there for number six. Number seven is said the cell shown in the diagram has been magnified. 3,000 times. It said the diagram is 21 millimeters wide. What is the actual diameter of the cell? Now, point to note here, when it said something is 3,000 times magnified, it means that it was multiplied by 3,000. So to get back your actual size, what you have to do is to divide by 3,000. So number seven will be B. Because you're dividing the size here, which is the actual size, divided by the magnification size to give you your actual size. To get the magnification is the opposite um, calculation. So it'll be 21 multiplied by 3,000 to get the magnified size. Okay, so B is our answer. All right, number eight. Number eight reads that the diagram shows two plant cells. One is P and one is Q. And of course, there are two plant cells as identified. If you look at the shape, you see the vacuole, you see the nucleus, you see the cell wall, you see the cell membrane. The outermost layer is the cell wall. Then you have a cell membrane. We Here is a nucleus. Here is a vacuole that I'm pointing to at this time. And of course, the remaining portion here will be the cytoplasm. So he said, how does P differ from Q? Looking at P versus Q, you notice that in Q, you see these um, other cells, well, other organelles within the cell. And these organelles, they are chloroplasts because plant cell will have a lot of chloroplasts. So here now, cell P has no chloroplasts indicated in it. So therefore, um, this will be B for our answer. Okay. All right. So no chloroplasts is present in P. All right. Let's go to question number nine. And question number nine is at which diagram shows a sensory neuron. And we only have two neurons here. 
because this is a regular cell. If you notice, you have a nucleus and so on. B and C are neurons, but which one is a sensory? And the easy way to identify sensory is that the cell body is on the side. So the identification of the cell body on the side of the neuron indicate that it is a sensory neuron. Okay? Um, this one for B is actually a motor neuron where the cell body is at the end. So at one end, you see the cell body. That's a motor neuron. D is a sperm cell. Okay, so number nine there is C. Number 10. And number 10 is an experiment was set up to demonstrate a process which occurs in living organisms. And this process, let's investigate what process is this. And so here we have uh, two solutions. We have solution X and solution Y. Now, the level of solution X is at this point. Let me just indicate it right here. All right, so that's the level of solution X. And then we have solution Y in the beaker. We have a tissue funnel and we have um, a partially permeable membrane at the tip of the tissue funnel. Now, since we have two different solutions, we know for sure that this process will be osmosis. Okay? Now, the statement now state that after 30 minutes, the level in the tissue funnel was higher. So let's just put a mark in that this increased about there. Okay? It's the fact that it increased. That's the most important thing. It doesn't matter how high. The fact that solution X increased. Now, so what does this show? Now, a quick point to note, if the level of the solution in the tissue funnel should increase, it therefore means water will move from the outside into the inside of the tissue funnel. That means what is moving from the beaker into the tissue funnel. Okay? So what is causing that? That's very important to note. What is causing that? If water is moving from the, from the beaker in, it therefore means that water is moving from a dilute solution into a concentrated solution. And that's something you need to know about osmosis. So water moves from dilute solution into concentrated solution. So what we know here is that Y is dilute or more dilute compared to X itself. Okay, so X should be more concentrated. So let's look at our options. And the options here is that X, solution X is more concentrated than solution Y. And absolutely, this will be your answer right off the bat. Okay, and mean we could go through the other options and you will realize that they are false because the solution X and Y are of equal concentrations. If the concentrations are equal, then there'll be no net movement of um, water. So the levels will remain the same. If X is dilute and Y is concentrated, then X will decrease and Y will increase, okay? And then D is saying that the solute diffuses from Y to solution X, which is not true. The solute will not move. So if it was sugar, the sugar stays there. But the solvent will move, which is water. So definitely A is our answer there. Now let's go to number 11. And number 11, it says some plant cells are placed in a solution with a higher concentration. This is very important. Higher concentration. Very, very important, right? Than that of the cells. So if the concentration is higher than what is inside the cell, then we expect water to leave this cell into the solution, okay? So it's a movement of water by osmosis. It will leave the cell. So let's look at where the, it will leave the cell. is between C and D. So these two will be out because the only way A and B could be correct is if the solution was dilute, okay? All right, or even distilled water. So it will go in. But since it's higher concentration than the cell, water must leave. And if water leaves the cell, then the cell itself, they say the volume of the vacuole will decrease because remember the vacuole stores water, right? So if water is leaving the cell, the vacuole will decrease. So option C will be our correct answer for this question. All right, let's go to question number 12 now. And question number 12, it said that which enzyme breaks down starch? 
All right, so right off the bat here, we're going to see your answer here because amylase um, breaks down starch. And just to point this out, we have two types of amylase in the digestive system. We have one that is called salivary amylase, which is in the mouth. And the salivary amylase will break down starch into maltose. And we also have a pancreatic amylase. And the pancreatic amylase, which is producing the pancreas and working the small intestine, they will finish the job by you now breaking down the maltose that was formed in the mouth into glucose. All right, so definitely um, amylase works with starch. Amylase breaks down carbohydrates. Starch is a carbohydrate. Lipase breaks down fat, so definitely that can't be your answer. Protease breaks down proteins, and you must know two proteases that are present in our body. And um, one is pepsin, which is found in the stomach, and then the other one is trypsin that is found in the small intestine that is produced by the pancreas. So trypsin is a protease as well. So number 12 is definitely A. All right, number 13. Now let's go to 13 real quick. Now number 13, is said, what color would be expected if two pieces of fish were tested separately using Benedict's um, Benedict test and the Beret test? So if you use Bendix solution and the Beret solution, what should you get? Now remember, Benedix is used as test for sugar, and Benedix itself is blue, and it will change to brown, red, or orange um, if sugar is present. Now the Beret solution is used as test for proteins, and Beret is also a blue solution. So both of them are blue solutions, but Beret will change into purple or violet if protein is present. So if you're testing fish, you will not, you should not see um, sugar, right? Unless they specify that is a sugar glazed fish, right? But fish by itself, pure fish, only meat, flesh, then you will not see sugar. So the blue solution should remain blue. All right, these two blue black will definitely not be correct. Orange will not be correct. So yes, it will, should remain blue. So this is correct. And the beret, since it's protein, it should change into purple or violet. And so definitely option A will be our answer right there. All right, number 14. Uh, number 14, let's go down to that real quick. All right, so for number 14, now what this is saying now is say that uh, one gram of carbohydrate provides 16 kilojoules of energy in the body. One gram of protein provides 17 kilojoules of energy in the body. Now we say that 100 gram of a food contains 50 grams of carbohydrates. Let me just quickly highlight that. And then it contains 10 grams of protein, but there is no fat. And a point to note here that fat provides the most energy per gram. So I just wanted to kind of know that just in case you may see a question with that. Fats will produce or provide the most energy per gram. But our primary source of energy is carbohydrates. Okay, so please just make sure you understand that concept. Now, the question now asks, how much energy is provided by 100 grams of this food? So again, in 100 gram, 50 grams of carbohydrates. So if one gram of carbohydrate produces 16 kilojoules, so let's just quickly do our mathematics right there. So we're going to multiply uh, 16. So let's say 16 times 50. And 16 multiplied by 50, what we should get there is, uh, no, it's 800. So yeah, 800. Okay. All right. So 800 um, kilojoules from the carbohydrates. And for proteins, now it's going to be, 10 is 10 grams multiplied by 17 kilojoules. It's going to be um, over 17 multiplied by 10. And that will give us 170. And so let's put that there. And so the total here now, 170, 170. And a total there will be 0, 7, and 9. So our total here, based on this information, should be 970 kilojoules of energy provided by that 100 gram of food. 
Okay, so number 14, there is D. All right, so let's jump into our next question, which is question number 15. And question number 15, is said, which row correctly matches parts of the digestive system and associated organs with their functions? Now, we have three functions here. We have digestion, absorption, and assimilation. Now, remember what is digestion. Digestion is a broken down of food or substances into smaller portions that can be absorbed. And now absorption is when these nutrients that come from food, because digestion is changing the food into nutrients. And so the nutrients that are formed now are taken into the bloodstream, and that is absorption. Now assimilation is when these absorbed nutrients now become a part of the body or tissues of the body. So let's run through this. Digestion, esophagus does not involve in digestion. It's only a passage or a movement of the food from one place to the next by wave-like action. So esophagus on the digestion here will be incorrect. The stomach involves in digestion, absolutely. All right? The pancreas is not for digestion. It is for secretion or production of enzymes. All right? And remember, there are three enzymes produced by the pancreas, our pancreatic amylase, our trypsin, and lipase. So we can know that C will be your answer because it's the only one that is correct for digestion right now, okay? Um, in terms of digestion is taking place there, right? All right, and um, for absorption, um, let us go back a little bit when I talk about digestion. Um, again, the pancreas produces the enzymes for digestion. So it do have digestive properties in terms of producing enzymes, but no digestion is taking place there, okay? Now, absorption is in the small intestine, so definitely C is looking good straight across. Um, across. And assimilation, the liver, um, substances are taken from the small intestine after they absorb into the liver. For example, our amino acids, and then as amino acids now are used differently or for different functions to make proteins that are needed um, different parts of the body. Also, the glucose that are taken there as well will store it in the form of glycogen, if you have excess glucose, and then some of the glucose will send to the cells of the body to carry out respiration. So definitely, number 15 is C. All right, let's go to number 16. And number 16, is said, which substance is secreted in, small, in the small intestine? So actually, it is secreted into the small intestine. Now, bile... Um, let's hold on to bile a little bit because bile is made in liver, stored in the gallbladder, but it is pumped or secreted into the small intestine because bile works in the small intestine to break down fat molecules into fatty droplets. Okay, In other words, it is used to emulsify fats. All right, so bile is a good option there because its it, it action is in the small intestine. Now, hydrochloric acid, hydrochloric acid definitely secreted in the stomach. All right, so the stomach is acidic. Um, saliva is in the mouth. Pepsin is also in the stomach. So yes, bile will be our absolute answer for this question. All right, let's go to question number 17. Well, question number 17 is said, a woman selects a meal for lunch. Her selection on its own would provide the closest. It said, which selection on its own would provide the closest match to a balanced diet. All right, so let's run through this uh, real quick. And it's a chicken sauce, Johnny cake, and coffee. The chicken sauce, depending on what is in the sauce, uh, but generally sauce is mainly protein because that's the meat. The Johnny cake is carbohydrate. And the coffee, depending on how you sweeten the coffee, may, may be um, sugar, which is, again, carbohydrate. Now, turkey sandwich. Uh, now, turkey sandwich, again, it's also um, subjective in terms of based on how the turkey sandwich is made. Um, it, it could have lettuce in it. It could have different things in the sandwich, so I don't know. But let's say turkey and the bread alone. That's only protein and carbohydrates. Chips by themselves will be carbohydrates and, of course, oil. So you're going to be a little bit of fat as well. Soda is pretty much um, sugar which is a carbohydrate, and 
Let's go to C. Said fried chicken, macaroni, and water. Yeah, very good meal indeed. But um, the fried chicken is protein, and because it's fried, you're going to get a little bit of grease. So there's more fat, macaroni again. You may get a little protein, carbohydrates, and again, some fat, and then water. But meatloaf here, um, meatloaf, so you get carbohydrate and the meat, which is carbohydrate and protein. Garden salad, you get some vegetables, so you're going to get your vitamins and the minerals and so on. Milk, you get minerals as well, and water is also in milk. So option D, I said, will have more of the needed nutrients. And we cannot say that we cannot specify what a balanced diet is because different person may have different balanced diets based upon their activities, their stage of life, and many other factors, right? But balanced diet should include most of the needed, if not all, well, let's say all of the needed nutrients in their correct proportions, all right? And correct proportion is based upon need. So my balanced diet may not be your balanced diet, okay? All right, number 18. And number 18, it said the red equation for photosynthesis is given below. We have here carbon dioxide plus water give you glucose and oxygen. And we know that is definitely the equation for photosynthesis. And please also note that you should know the chemical equation for photosynthesis as well. Now, the question now reads, what conditions are needed for photosynthesis to take place. Now, we already have carbon dioxide and water. Those things are needed. So what else are needed beside that? We need some light. Remember that, right? And we also need chlorophyll to absorb the light. So number 18 is definitely A. All right? Um, the cytoplasm, no, that's not, taken, that's not needed for um, photosynthesis at all. All right? So definitely we're just running with, with A. Um, there's no discussion about that one at all. Number 19. And number 19 now reads that a plant with, a, with variegated leaves, and variegated leaves mean that pretty much two colors, uh, typically green and white. Okay, so a portion of the leaf is, is white, a portion of it is green. All right, and it says, so a plant with variegated leaves has the starch removed from its leaf by placing it in a dark cupboard. And just to point out how the, how the starch has been removed from the leaf is when it's in a dark cupboard, the plant will still need to respire. So it will break down the starch into sugars and use the sugars, um, which is glucose, for respiration. So, good, so the food will be used up. Okay? However, now, black paper is then fixed on one leaf as shown, and the plant is exposed to light. So now once, once the plant is exposed to light, the plant will start now to photosynthesize again and make new glucose, which will eventually turn to starch. So after 24 hours, which part of the leaf contains starch? Now, the part that will contain starch is the part that will photosynthesize. We have the green region, we have the white region. Only the green region will photosynthesize. Um, so let's look at the regions here. A is a white portion, so therefore no photosynthesis, therefore no sugar, no starch will be found there. B is covered with the black paper. So if it's covered with black paper, no light can penetrate. That means no photosynthesis, no sugar, no starch. C is pretty much the same as D. Um, no, C is the same as B. It is an area which was covered with the black paper, hence no photosynthesis. Um, here is the green portion, which is the line D. And so we're going to go with this because this is the green area. It absorbs light. Photosynthesis takes place. Sugar was produced, and hence starch will be made. All right, so number 20. And number 20, it said, which substance are transported in the phloem? All right, now let's go through this and highlight a few things. Um, transported by the phloem. So let's talk about what the phloem transports first. The phloem transports plant food and sugars. The sugar that is transported in the phloem is sucrose. So plant food and sugars in the form of sucrose. Now, starch is not being transported in it. So let me just highlight starch. Starch is not transported. Starch is a stored molecule. Okay, starch molecules, they are stored. 
So therefore, it's not being transported. So starch is out of the picture. Amino acid, yes, because amino acids are the monomers that are used to make proteins and plants need amino acids that they will use to make their proteins. And of course, plants do have proteins as well, all right? Now, part B now, or option B is amino acid and sucrose, which seemingly good because both of them are transported there. But let's look at C. It's a proteins and starch. Again, starch is incorrect. So anyway, C starch, they're incorrect. So option A, C, and D, they're incorrect because starch is stored, not transported. And again, proteins are really not the portions that are being Proteins form structures, so proteins are not transported. The amino acid, though, which is the smaller units of proteins, they are transported. So definitely um, 20 is B. All right, let's go to 21. And we are almost to the half mark. Now, 21, it said that four plants were set up to investigate the rate of transpiration using a potometer. And potometer. I wanted to make sure I mention this because it's a invest, investigate the rate of transpiration. The potometer itself does not necessarily tell you the rate of transpiration. What it does, though, is measure the amount of water uptake or the rate of water uptake. Okay, because remember now, why it cannot specifically, it cannot specifically or um, give you the exact value of transpiration because some of the water that is uptake in the plant are being taken into the plant, some of that water is used for other functions such as photosynthesis and also transport and other chemical reactions. So all the water that is taken up into the plant is not used for transpiration or is not transpired um, away from the plant, all right? So just to make a mention of that. All right, so in which plant did the most transpiration occur? Um, what I will say, though, that the rate of water uptake is an indication of how fast transpiration is taking place, but, is, but it can't give you the exact value. So right here now, we have distance moved by bubble in millimeter. And again, once the potometer is used and the plant is, is in the potometer, you will see water bubble moving throughout the potometer. The water bubble is an indication of the movement of water. So, of course, the higher the bubble moves or the greater distance the bubble move is the indication of greater rate of transpiration. So definitely we're going to go here um, as A as our answer for question number 21. All right. Number 22 is a which process, uh, let's go back a little bit, is a which process inside cells releases energy useful to the human body. And this is now very important. This which process. And off the bat, digestion is not, excretion is not, ingestion is not, because ingestion is taken in food into the mouth. And so respiration is what produces um, energy. And so right off the bat, we know that question number 22 there has to be D. All right, number 23. And question number 23, he said which, no, sorry, he said what two features of an alveolus aid in gaseous exchange? Now, gaseous exchange, for example, you must remember for something to have gaseous exchange, you must have diffusion. And so, therefore, this, the, the structure must be moist. You can, write down, you can write these down. The structure must be moist, must have a large surface area, must be thin, and also a great amount of capillaries or a large supply of capillaries. And so let's run through it. Dry surface, that's out right there as well. One cell thick is good. Dry surface and associated with many capillaries. Many capillaries is good, but the dry surface part is out. So A and B will out because of dry surface. Um, saying it is moist is good, but few capillaries is not the best thing. Um, D is saying that is moist and the wall is one cell thick, which means very thin. One cell thick is very thin, in other words. So 23 there will have to be DA, all right? Now let's jump to question number 24. Now question number 24 says, which blood vessel, if it were to become blocked, could lead directly to a heart attack? So let's go through these blood vessels really quick. So 24A, it said coronary artery. 
Now, the coronary artery is what supplies the heart itself with blood. So in other words, it supplies the heart with the nutrients, the oxygen, and all those things it needs for it to function. So if the heart is not being supplied with nutrients and oxygen to carry it respiration and, and nutrients to keep it healthy, then definitely it will cause problems of the heart and the heart could fail. So A is a good option. All right, the pulmonary artery um, definitely is not good because that one will go to the lungs, so it'll affect the lungs mainly. All right, the pulmonary vein is also, again, from the lungs. Um, so this one coming from the lungs, this one is going to the lungs. Pulmonary artery goes to the lungs. Pulmonary vein comes from the lungs back into the heart. The vena cava is coming from the body into the heart. So the one that directly affects the heart in terms of its function is the coronary artery. Okay, so 24 there will be A. Right, let's go to 25. And question number 25, which is halfway our mark right now, is a diagram shows a double circulation. And what is a double circulation? Let me just put a line through this. Um, I'm going to break this thing in half. So the heart is here and half of it is on one side, right? So double circulation means that the heart is pumping deoxygenated blood and oxygenated blood at the same time without being mixed. That is double circulation. So it's like a two-pump system. They will never mix. And because a, sub, uh, uh, a septum is right in the middle of the heart that separates the oxygenated blood from the oxygenated blood, and both sides of the heart are working as individual pumps. One is pumping oxygenated blood, one is pumping deoxygenated blood. And so the question now asks here, which vessels carry oxygenated blood? Now, a kind of easy way to know this is that whatever is going to the body must be oxygenated blood. So B must be oxygenated. A must also be oxygenated as well. It's coming from the, from the lungs itself. And a point to note here is that this side that I'm pointing to right now, which is A and B, that is the left side of the heart, which is your right hand because you're facing the heart. So this is the left side. So A and B should be our answer. All right, and so let's go into that. So A and B, and that means A should be our answer right here. All right, the other two letters, which is, um, they are C and D. C and D will definitely be deoxygenated. Coming from the body and also going to the lungs, they are deoxygenated. All right, question number 26. Now, question number 26, it said, which group contains substances that are all carried around the body dissolved in the plasma? All right, so let's run through option A. For option A, it said amino acids, um, which is true. Carbon dioxide is pretty much associated with the hemoglobin um, in the red blood cell, but this is saying in the plasma of the blood. So um, because of carbon dioxide, it's wrong. Also glycogen. Glycogen is not um, transported around the blood. It's actually stored in the liver and actually converted back into glucose in the liver. So it's not transported around the body at all. All right? Um, B, it said glucose and glycogen. Glycogen, again, is a no-no. Um, lactic acid is produced in the muscles during strenuous exercise or when you have low amount of oxygen in the cells. And so the lactic acid will stay in the muscles until oxygen is supplied to break them down. So just a point to note that lactic acid can be broken down when oxygen is available or when lactic acid reacts with oxygen. All right. So um, B is not an option there. And estrogen, yes, estrogen can be transported in the blood as well. Oxygen, yes. Glycogen is a no-no because glycogen, again, is a stored component um, within the liver. Um, salts, definitely, because salts will, will be found in the arteries, especially going to the kidneys to be removed. And then uh, some, of, some of the salt will be reabsorbed, especially sodium, back into the blood um, at the convolutions in the, in the nephrons, just to point it out. Insulin definitely is an hormone, an hormone um, transported in the, in the blood plasma as well. Urea is also a good substance. So definitely um, D is correct for number 26. All right. Number 27. In number 27, now say that the graph shows the effect of several minutes of vigorous exercise on heart rate. 
Now, vig vigorous exercise will increase the heart rate for sure. We know that, right? Is a how long did it take the individual to recover from this vigorous exercise? All right, so first and foremost, let us look at what is happening here in terms of vigorous exercise. Now, we know this point, this peak, is where the heart rate is really, really high. So notice heart rate here is extremely high there. Right here, we can see at this point, there is no exercise taking place during here. So right here is where the person actually resting. The person starts to exercise somewhere right here, and the heart rate increases really, really high. Now, what is happening here now? We need to figure out, now, when is the person recovering? And notice the person start to recover because this slope is dropping, the heart rate is dropping. So anywhere right, let me, let me say about right here, anywhere about right here will be a good point to say that the person is actually recovered. Anywhere beyond here, we're going to put this line now, the person is fully recovered and at rest. So the person is at rest from this point onwards because it's equal to the first part. So the first part here was at rest. Beyond this point is also at rest. Here is where the person actually recovered when the slope is actually um, technically finished, in other words, right? So anywhere about right here. So let's say the person start at 5.5, roughly 5.5, and finishes at 25.5, they're about. So it will take from 25.5 and minus 5.5 from that, um, we should get there about 20 minutes. So 20 minutes should be our answer. Okay, for the person to be fully recovered, then it will be about the 30, um, 30 to 35 minutes to be fully recovered and start resting again. Right. So the 20 minutes, yeah, will be the one that is um, good for recovery. The person has recovered. All right, 28. Um, in question number 28, right? Question number 28, it said that the diagram shows two blood cells, X and Y. And blood cell X is a red blood cell. As you notice that, there's no nucleus there. There's an indentation, which means it's biconcave. And the other name for a red blood cell is erythrocyte. And Y is a type of white blood cell. White blood cells are leukocytes. And this specific one is phagocyte. And phagocyte, why we know this? Because of this irregular shape nucleus. All right, so it's, the question now asks, what are the functions of X and Y? Now, remember, X is the red blood cell. Y is the white blood cell or phagocyte, right? All right, so let's go through this. Now, X, which is the red blood cell, phagocyte, just remember that um, because the diagram is on top. Now, X carries, um, carries out phago, uh, phagocytosis, which is not true because red blood cells do not do that. White blood cells do. Matter of fact, the phagocyte um, will carry out phagocytosis. So this is not true for X at all. So this is actually wrong. Um, cell X carries oxygen, which is true. So B look good because of carrying oxygen. Um, cell Y produces antibodies, which is not true. Let me just cross out the one that are not true. This is not true for that. And matter of fact, both of them for A are not true. Carries oxygen, it is true. Produce antibodies, not true, because it is lymphocytes that produce antibody. Phagocyte will engulf and digest bacteria. Um, carries oxygen is true here for cell X. Carries carbon dioxide for white blood cell, no, that is not true. Um, produce antibodies, X produce antibodies, not true. No, we're in trouble. Carries oxygen, not true. Now, if you notice here, all these for Y, they are actually incorrect. Um, we have two correct one for X. So there's no option here for this. So there's no answer. But the answer for this, um, we could change any of this, which is B or um, C if you want. You can make a note on, on your paper. Um, and you can make right here that cell Y engulf and digest bacteria, all right, or pathogens, right? Um, they do not produce antibodies. They actually engulf and destroy the bacteria. If it was a lymphocyte, then B would be a correct answer. But it's not a lymphocyte. It's a phagocyte. All right, so there's no option there for question number 28, unfortunately. 29, what is the main function of sweating in the human body? Now, 29. 
Now, the main function for sweating is to cool the body down. Notice is when you're hot exercising, you normally sweat. Okay? So, sweat is to cool the body down. Um, but I must say this, while you're producing sweat, you're also excreting a certain amount of salt and urea as well, um, which is the same content of urine. So, but the main function for sweating is to cool the body down, even though it plays a secondary role in excretion. All right, so 29 there is B. All right, so it's not to excrete urea at all. Um, to excrete urea is by urination. All right, it's not by sweating. All right, to remove excess salt, again, is by urination, not by sweating. But sweating do release some urea and salt. All right, all right, so let's go to number 30. And question number 30 said, which row in the table shows the effects of eating a meal containing carbohydrates on the concentration of insulin and glucose in the blood? So if we eat carbohydrates, right, what will happen to the concentration of insulin and glucose in the blood? Now, eating carbohydrates, right, will produce a lot of sugars because remember when carbohydrates, the final product, the end product of, di of the digestion, or if you don't want to use the word digestion, you can say the hydrolysis, the hydrolysis of carbohydrates or the digestion of carbohydrates will produce glucose or sugars, glucose particularly, right? So if you produce a lot of glucose, then you must produce a lot of insulin because insulin will break down the excess glucose into glycogen. So this should be increased. So only B and D could be your option right there so far for 30, right? But what will happen to glucose if you produce a lot of insulin is that the glucose convert to glycogen, so therefore the glucose should decrease because of increased insulin. So we say increase and decrease. Yeah, so D will be your option there. Increases the concentration of insulin and the decrease of glucose because of the conversion of glucose into glycogen. Now, 31. Now, question 31 is so that the diagram shows a section through a human kidney which structure contains the lowest concentration of urea. The lowest concentration of urea means that what is leaving the kidney because going in should have the highest amount. So A should have the highest amount going in. So that is the renal artery. And once it goes into the kidney, the kidney will filter the blood, removing urea, salt, and water. It will also take out glucose, but the glucose will be reabsorbed. And so coming back from the kidney should be the less amount of urea. So we're going to um, highlight D as our option right there. All right? All right. So let's go into our next question, which is question number 32. Now, in question number 32, all right, so this is a lot of di um, diagrams. So these type of questions, please do not just skip over them. Read through them properly. Make sure you understand exactly what they're asking you to do so you're able to e um, effectively answer the question. So let's read through it. It said the diagram shows shoots in two, and this is a showing shoots. I think this is focusing on shoots. Showing shoots in two experiments on the trophic response of shoot. Again, it's talking about shoot to gravity and also to light. So the experiment is only focusing on the response of shoot to gravity and also to light. Now, experiment one, um, it showed the effect of gravity on the shoot. So notice here, the start of the experiment, the shoot grows upwards, which is in the opposite direction to gravity. So after three days, let's look at experiment two. And experiment two, it shows the effect of light. And light is only placed on one side based on this diagram right here. And the shoot, it bends or grows towards the light. Okay? So notice the shoot in the first one to gravity grows up. And then the one that's responding to light grows towards the light. So the question now is that, oh, have the seedlings responded? And remember, we're only testing for shoot, right? So a positive response will be a tick and a negative response will be a, an X. And so therefore the shoot reacts negatively to gravity because it still grew up. So CRD would be correct. And then the, the shoot now 
to light will be positive. So the, the gravity is negative. And so C is our correct answer for question number 32. All right. The positive light, negative to gravity. All right. So let's go to our next question right here, which is question number 33. Now, in question number 33, he said an experiment um, to investigate phototropism. And phototropism is responding to light. All right. So a plant shoot is grown with light coming from one side only. And so if you notice, um, light is coming from the right. And at the start of the experiment, at the end of the experiment, you notice that the shoot itself bend, um, bend towards the light. And so the question asks, now, have a two days in which region has the greatest rate of growth occurred? Where is the most growth taking place? So let's point this out, point, point this out real quick. Is that auxin is produced in the tip of the plant, but auxin moves to the darker side of the plant or where there's less light. And so more auxin will be in this area. Therefore, more growth will take place in this area. Therefore, C will be our option. B will have the least amount of growth because that's where the direct light is. And so therefore, that's why this is shorter. This is longer. It bends towards the light. 34. So 34 now say the diagram shows four um, flasks which were set up to investigate the conditions needed for germination. Now, germination is very specific and peculiar in terms of what is required. Now, I'm going to point this out. To, for seeds to germinate, there's no need for light and there's no need for carbon dioxide, okay? Because there's no leaf for photosynthesis. Just to point it out. Now, it said, in which flask will the seed germinate the most? And before you even move on to investigating which of these will be the greatest germination, the condition needed for germination is that you must have some form of moisture or you may say water. You need oxygen for respiration. You need a correct temperature. And why I say correct temperature? Because some seeds require lower temperatures. Some seed requires higher temperatures to germinate, all right? Or warmer temperatures. All right, so just to point that out. All right, now um, in flask A, it's a dry cotton. So A, no germination will take place because it's dry, okay? Moreover, the flask is closed, so therefore no oxygen will get into the flask, right? Now flask B, you have a cotton right here, um, but the cotton was the cotton hole was boiled, um, so you have boiled water in this flask. So if you have boiled water, then what will happen to the seeds is that the enzymes in the seeds will denature. So, they, so the boiling water will destroy the enzymes within the seed. Now for flask C and D, they are the exact same thing. They are open, oxygen could get in. Um, the, the cotton hole is damp, yep, and the seeds are there. But the difference between C and D is that C is at a higher temperature, if you notice it, and D is at a lower temperature. And remember now, to activate enzymes, you need a warm temperature, not hot or too high temperature, but moderate warm temperature. Um, and this is 2 degrees Celsius. The enzymes might work, but they're going to be slow because the enzymes will be inactive. Uh, but the enzymes are more active at a warmer temperature, we call it the optimal temperature. All right, so this will be better than um, plus D. So 34 there will be C as our option. All right, um, let's go to question number 35. And question number 35 is that the table lists some processes which take place during reproduction in flowing plants and mammals. It says which row is correct. So let's look at the correct row right here. So fertilization needed, implantation needed, pollination needed. Now, flower plants and, and so flowing plants and animals need fertilization. And yes, we're going to agree with that. So A, seemingly correct so far. All right. Implantation needed, mammals only. Yeah, implantation takes place in the uterus, definitely. After the egg is being fertilized, pollination needed, flowering plants only. All right, so A is seemingly good. Let's see if we could pick up at least one wrong um, option for B, C, and D. 
flowering plants and animals. Yes, okay, this is right here. Flowering plants and mammals need implantation. Not true. Um, fertilization, mammals only. Not true. Flowering plants and mammals, that part is true. Mammals only here is not true. So anyway, A is our correct answer, no matter what we look at at this, uh, at the other options, right? So 35 there is A. Now let's go to 36 real quick. And so we can get out of here and do some other reviews soon. Okay, so 36 is a, which hormone is responsible for ovulation? Now we have four hormones here. We have estrogen. Estrogen is for secondary sexual, secondary sexual characteristics in females. All right, so um, estrogen is not the answer there. We have FSH, which is follicle stimulating hormones. And follicle stimulating hormone is for the development and growth of the follicle. Luteinizing, luteinizing hormone is the answer because luteinizing hormone is, is for ovulation and it's also for the development of the yellow body. All right? All right, so yes, or what they call it, corpus luteum. So option C is definitely our answer. D is testosterone, and testosterone is important for sperm production and also secondary sexual characteristics in males. All right, so 36 is definitely C. All right, let's jump to 37. So in question number 37, you see the diagram shows the female reproductive system of a human. And this reproductive system, of course, is a female. And it said, what is the name of structure X? And right here, when I'm going to label it, um, color this in green, that's the vagina right here. And then up here is the uterus. And so X is between the uterus and the vagina. And we also call X the neck of the womb. So that is the cervix. All right, so right there, that is the cervix. All right, let's jump to the next question. No need to even discuss that one. Number 38, it's a bar chart. The bar chart shows the number of pregnancies in four groups of 100 women over the same period. Each group used different type of birth control. All right. So what we're going to look at now is said that uh, we have the number of pregnancies on the y-axis here, and then we have the type of birth control on the x-axis. So we have the con contraceptive pill. We have the intrauterine device, which is IUD. We have the diaphragm. We have the monitoring body temperature. All right, you monitor, you, you monitor body temperature to see, okay, when is the best time for ovulation and so on. All right, so here now I said which statement about the bar chart is correct. And option A is saying that the least effective of the four types of birth control is the chemical. And the chemical here is the contraceptive pills. Now, it is the lowest bar. doesn't mean that it is the least effective, right? Lowest bar means most effective because number of pregnancy. So, therefore, you have least amount of pregnancy using the pills. And pill, pills are chemical, okay? Now, option B, option B is said that the least effective of the four type of birth control is the mechanical method. The mechanical method will be the diaphragm and the, and the IUD, right? They are mechanical method. C is saying that the least effective of the four types um, of birth control is the natural method. The natural method is looking at your body temperature. That's a natural method. And then estimate when is the best time um, to conceive or not to conceive. Yeah, so definitely C is correct. And D is saying that the least effective of the four types of birth control is surgical. There's no surgical method actually shown here. All right. And so even though a doctor is needed to put in the IUD, it is a mechanical device. All right. And so here, again, is the least effective because the monitoring body temperature, you actually have the most pregnancy. All right. So let's go to question 39 now. And question number 39 is said that the diagram shows the human brain which area is responsible for coordination, um, coordinating movements. And movements is a form of, of coordination and balance. And A and D, they are actually the same part. They are the cerebrum. And the cerebrum is for voluntary actions, for intelligence, memory, and so on. We have um, B, which is the cerebellum. And the cerebellum is for coordination and balance. 
So 39, they're going to be B. All right, so it's for coordinating movement, which is balance and coordination. C is the medulla oblongata, and the medulla oblongata is for involuntary actions, such as your breathing, your digestion, and so on. Question number 40. Question number 40. It says the diagram represents a simple reflex arc. We have the spinal cord. We have a neuron R. A neuron R is the sensor neuron. Why? Because it's coming from the, from the sense organ, which is the skin in the finger. And then you right here, you see, I'm going to put a green spot right here. That's the cell body, which is on the side. So that's a sensory neuron. P is really a neuron. And then um, Q is a motor neuron. In that exact order. So the impulse travel from here to that way, come down to this way. All right, so let's see what they're asking us to do now. Is that what sequence of neuron does a nerve impulse pass through during a reflex action? So it must go through R first, indicating by this arrow that I put on this one. Then it go to P, then it go to Q. So it must be R, P, Q. Okay, so R, P, Q. The RPQ is D, okay? RPQ is D. All right, so that was question number 40. All right, so D is that answer. Question number 41 and 42 refers to the diagram of the high shown below. Now, here is our iris, as I pointed out. Um, D is our lens. B is our retina. And after the retina, you have your choroid. And after your choroid, you have your sclera or sclerotic coat. And C is your optic nerve. Number 41, it's a which label structure contains receptors that respond to light. And that is the retina. The retina contains rods and cones. Rods is for black and white or dim light. And the cones is for colored or bright light. So the retina there will be B. So structure B for 41 will be our answer, okay? 42, it's a which label structure is affected by the process of accommodation. What is accommodation? First and foremost. Now, accommodation is the changing of the shape of the lens to focus on distance or, or distant and near objects, okay? So it's really the adjustment of the lens to have a better focus. So the lens should be your answer. Let's see what the lens is. The lens is D. So 42 is structure D, which is D. All right. Now uh, we are at 43 now. So question number 43. Now question number 43 said an animal has 36 chromosomes. So we have 36 chromosomes here. Let's highlight that. In each body cell, how many chromosomes in each body cell um, came from the male parents. Now, the male parent, first thing you need to understand is that the total number of chromosomes is half the mother, half the father. Okay? Because remember, they produce gametes and they come together to, to form the zygote. So, half that number must be from the father and half from the mother. So, if you look carefully, half of 36 is what? Half of 36 will be 18. Okay, so 18 from the mother, 18 from the father, both of them together give you 36. Half of 36 is 18. All right. Now, 44. Which cell could be formed when a cell divides by meiosis? Meiosis, you produce four daughter cells, and each of those cells have half the number of chromosomes as the parent cell, and meiosis only produce gametes. So the only thing that is correct right here is the sperm cell. Sperm cell is a gamete. Okay, there's no need to discuss that one. 45. Now, question 45 here, it asks, which term describes a length of DNA that controls, this is going to be important right here now, the length of DNA that controls a characteristic of an individual. Which piece of the chromosome or a portion of the chromosome that controls the characteristic of an individual, and that is genes. Genes control your characteristic. Remember, even the, the, the definition for genetics is the study of how characteristics are passed from parents to offspring by means of what? Genes. 
So genes control your characteristics. All right, good. All right, um, 40, or oh, let me just point out this word because this word, uh, you may wonder what this is, nucleic acid. Nucleic acid, all right, there are two types in our body, DNA and RNA. So nucleic acid is either DNA or RNA, right? So nucleic acid could not be the answer there anyways. All right, um, 46. Question number 46. It reads now that what is expected to happen to the recessive trait when pure breeding plants, and let's say pure breeding plants, showing the dominant um, trait or cross with a poor breeding plant showing the recessive trait. All right, let me just quickly show you what is happening here real quick. When I said that um, pure breeding plant for dominant, it means that is the homozygous dominant. So let's use let's use um, T, all right. Let's use T for 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 that. So we're gonna have two uppercase T's here. Okay, we're gonna have two uppercase T's. All right, so two uppercase T's. All right, and if we have two uppercase T's for that, let's do the recessive now. Pure bread for recessive. Pure mean only recessive. So we're gonna have two small T's here, and we could use any letters. I just want to use T um, as an example. So the two uppercase T's are purebred dominant. That means only dominant alleles are, alleles are there. Now, it said now what is expected. For A, so the recessive trait becomes dominant. No, that will never happen. Recessive trait can't become dominant trait in no shape nor form. Now, B now, it said that the recessive trait is never expressed in subsequent, in subsequent um, generations. Not necessarily true. It depends on how you actually cross. And remember, we also have something that is commonly called skipping generations, right? So a recessive trait could show up down the line. For C now, it said that the recessive trait is expressed by some offspring in the first generation. Um, but let's see what happened in the first generation, right? So if you do a Punnett square real quick, you're going to realize that if you put these like this, um, let's put the two uppercase T's on top. Just to show you what happened in the first generation here. And then put the two small t's at the side. It doesn't matter if you put them on top or side. It really don't matter to get the same result. Anyways, so in this box, you're going to get an uppercase and a lowercase. This other box here, you're going to get an uppercase and a lowercase. All right. The bottom one is upper and lowercase as well. Remember, it's row by columns. The last box is also upper and lowercase as well. And so if you notice the first generation here, they are all heterozygous. That means the recessive trait can never be shown. And so um, A is wrong, B is wrong, C is also wrong. And then D is saying that the recessive trait is expressed by some offspring in the second filial generation. And that will be true because if you take two of these um, offspring, which are two heterozygous, they will, then you're going to get a 3 to 1 ratio. That means 25% of the second generation will show recessive trait. All right? And so you can do the cross between two of the heterozygous, and you notice that you get 25% of the recessive trait being show, um, shown in the second generation. So yes, option D is correct, 46. All right, we're almost there. Four more questions to go. All right, so question 47, it said the Punnett square um, shows the expected offspring genotypes from a cross between two parents. What are the genotypes of the two parents? Okay, so now we have the box. We need to figure out now what is the genotype of the parent. So let's look at the easy way to do this. For you to get this box to be two uppercase Bs, then this column must be B, uppercase B, and this row must also be uppercase B. That's the only way you can get two uppercase B here, right? Uh, let's go to the next one right here. If this row now is... Uh, uppercase B, for you to get a lowercase B, then this must be a lowercase B here, right? Let's go to the bottom row. If this column is established as uppercase B, and here you have two uppercase Bs, then this row must also be uppercase Bs. So if you notice it now, you match up all them together, you get that. So that is correct. So one print must be uppercase Bs, the other one must, must be uppercase and lowercase B, which is homozygous. Um, dominant here on the side and on the top is heterozygous dominant. So let's see, B is our answer for 47. I could just circle this one. So B is correct for that. All right. 
Let's jump to our next question, which is 48. Now, for question number 48, it said, which, which is one possible disadvantage? So looking for a disadvantage. What is one possible disadvantage of growing genetically modified crops compared to growing non-genetically mod modified crops? So a disadvantage. Cheaper to produce. That is true. That is, a, that is an advantage for genetically modified crops because they will make the crops better for them to grow better, right? Cheaper, faster, and all of that. Greater nutritional values. If you modify them, it should be better. So that should be an advantage. Greater risk of causing allergic reactions. That's a disadvantage because based on how they are modified, they can cause um, allergy in some persons. All right, so greater resistance to pests, that should be an advantage right there. So 48 is C. All right, let's go to 49. Two more questions to go, and we are out of here. All right, so 49 and 50 refer to this graph. Okay, so I guess they leave the one that you have to analyze more for last. Okay, so anyways, they said that here now, it's a fish and beef cattle are farmed to, pro to provide a source of protein for humans. The graph shows changes in the global production of farmed fish and beef cattle since 1950. So if you look at the graph carefully, you notice here now that it's a global production per million ton. All right? Million tons, actually. And we have the number of years from 1950 to 2010. All right? So 2015 will be something somewhere right here. All right. So anyway, let's look at the question, what the question asks us to do. Now, 49, it said in 2012, which is um, 2012 will be about two lines after this, based on how the graph is divided by, yeah. So, in 2012, some scientists predicted that the global production of farmed fish in 2020 would be six times greater than the global production of farmed in 1990. So, we're going to use 1990 and, 2000 and 2020, right? Well, 2020 is not shown, but they said we're predicting that it, in 2020, it will be six times that of 1990. So we'll look at 1990 and see what is six times that. All right. So what you need to look at first and foremost here is said, what was the scientist, the scientist prediction for the global production of farmed fish in 2020? And again, is a prediction. The graph is not showing 2020. So we can't look at the graph and find 2020. What we know, though, we can find 1990, and it said it's six times that amount. So let's look at 1990. All right, what I'm going to do, let me just kind of zoom into the graph and see what 1990 is representing. So let's, that zoom should, should be all right. All right, so we're going to be right there. All right, a matter of fact, let me put a line in so it'll be a little bit easier uh, for us to do. All right, let's get a line. And we're going to move from 1990. And we're looking at the fish, right? So 1990 is right here. Let's go straight across with this line. And it is right there. So based on this line, if you notice it, um, let me just point it out real fast. If you notice this line, it stopped at the, uh, let me go this is second line above 10. And each line is by two. So here are going to be um, 10, 12, 14. So this is 14 right here, right? So let's quickly do a calculation. If this is 14, so 12 and 14. So if it's 14 in 1990, we can say 14 times 12, right? All right, so let's go back down to the question and then we can do the calculation right there. We don't want the page to be a little bit messy. All right, so let's zoom back in first and then we do the calculation here. All right, so again, we got... Um, 14 for 1990. So 14 for 1990. So we're going to say 14 and then going to multiply it by 6 because it says 6 times greater. So multiply by 6 and we should get our answer there as 14 times 6 is 84. All right. So 49 is C. So C is our option here for 49. All right. 14 times 6. Now let's. Oh, okay. All right, let me see, erase this. All right, final question here now. So our final question is question number 50. 
It said, what was the difference between the global production of beef cattle and global production of farmed fish in the year, 20, in, in, in the year 2000? Okay. So in the year 2000, what's the difference between fish and cattle? All right. So let's go onto a graph and see exactly what is happening between fish and cattle. Let's do another zoom into that. So at least we can see our numbers properly. And we're looking for 2000 at the year 2000. So right, right there should be okay. All right, that is good. All right, so let's put some lines in. All right, so we need a line in. Um, all right, I'm jumping the page a little bit. Just break me a little bit. Okay, I'm going to move that. All right, um, all right just a second. All right, this page is running away from me. All right, let me get it back in focus. All right. So we, I should be good now in terms of focusing this page. All right. So let me see if I could manipulate it. All right. So we need that zoom. All right. So something is going on with the page. Just a second. I'm going to get it back. So we need that zoom in. All right. So as soon as the page stops running, we will get it. All right, and the last, that's the last, last question there. I don't know what's going on with it. All right, but all we need to do is to get the graph in, and then we should be okay. All right? So we're going to get, we're going to be fine with that right now. All right, so for this, I just seem to have a little bit of issue with it. Okay, good. I'm good now. All right, so it's the last question. So let's zoom in first and go all the way back down to question 15 with this all right and we could okay so i'm going to zoom back into the graph and now we're going to look at the difference between both of them um real quick and we're looking at the fish and the cattle at the year 20 um at the year 2000 a matter of fact so 2000 for fish will be right here okay so i'm going to go straight across with this line from 2000 right here for the fish. Okay, so I'm going to take this line right over and I'm right here. All right, and then I'm going to do another line for 2000 for the cattle and 2000 for cattle will be right here. I'm just trying to line up this line properly. So make sure I get this line. Okay, it's right here. Good. So now I have my two lines. Um, all right, so let's do this now for my two lines. My first line here is the second line of, is the first line of a 30, so it's going to be 32. So one here is going to be 32. And this line here is the third line of a 50, so it's going to be 56. So my difference here is going to be 56 minus 32, okay? Uh, let me just go down to the question and do 56 minus 32, so we see, we see our option. Okay, so let me just get another zoom into that. Zoom back in. All right, that is good. So we say that it was 56. And so it's going to be 56 minus over 32. And 56 minus 32, that is um, 24. Okay, so this is 4 and 2. So 24 is our answer. And so A is our answer for number 50. All right, so I apologize for the little um, glitch just now. All right, so... Again, we're at the end of it, and I hope you do well in the examination. Take care, and I will see you soon. All right? Be good.